Good morning. And may I, on behalf of the members of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee, warmly welcome the officials from the Ministry of Finance, Investments Division, the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries, the Trinidad and Tobago National Petroleum Marketing Company Limited, NP, members of the media, as well as the general public. The Committee on Public Accounts, or the Committee on Public Account, Accounts Enterprises, has a mandate. And that mandate is to consider and report to the House on A, the audited accounts, balance sheets, and other financial statements of all enterprises that are owned and or controlled by or on behalf of the state. B, the Auditor General's report on any such accounts, balance sheets, and other financial statements. And C, whether policy is carried out efficiently, effectively, and economically, and whether expenditure conforms to the authority which governs it. The purpose of this meeting of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee is to examine the audited accounts, balance sheets, and other financial statements of the Trinidad and Tobago National Petroleum Marketing Company Limited, NP, for the period 2009 to 2017. Our committee is desirous of hearing the challenges being faced by the key stakeholders at NP in an attempt to determine some of the possible solutions to these challenges. The role of the committee is to help. May I repeat? The role of our committee is to help improve its delivery of services in an efficient, effective, and economic manner. Let me advise that our meeting, this meeting, is being held in public and is being broadcast live on the Parliament's Channel 11 and Radio 105.5 FM and the Parliament's YouTube channel, Pal View. Viewers and listeners can send their comments related to today's topic via email pal101 at ttparliament.org, facebook.com slash ttparliament, twitter at ttparliament. May I at this time invite officials from the Ministry of Finance, Investments Division, the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries, as well as the Trinidad and Tobago National Petroleum Marketing Company, Company Limited to introduce themselves. So I will start with the Ministry of Finance, Investments Division. Good morning. I am Jennifer Lutchman, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Investments Division, Ministry of Finance. 
Hello, good morning. My name is Tarugo Kylie Naipaul, Business Analyst at the Ministry of Finance Investments Division. Good morning. My name is Lester Hubert, the Director of Central Audit Committee, Investments Division, Ministry of Finance. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. I am Monty Bihari, Acting Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Good morning. My name is Mark Rutter, Director of Petroleum Operations Management Division. Good morning. Shalan Butcher, the Downstream Petroleum Director, Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Good morning. My name is Timmy Bach. I'm the Director of Energy Research and Planning Division at the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Good morning. Syed Hossain, Chairman, National Petroleum Marketing Company Limited. Good morning. Gwynard Mitchell, Chief Executive Officer, National Petroleum Marketing Company Limited. Good morning. Bina Polaya, Manager, Legal and Company Secretary, NP. Good morning. My name is Ian Ramuta, Manager, Engineering, Facilities and Maintenance, National Petroleum. Good morning. My name is Alison Khan Ali. I'm the General Manager, Retail and Industrial Fuels, Trinan Tobago National Petroleum Marketing Company. Good morning. My name is Joy John Benjamin. I am the Treasury and Management Accounting Manager on Special Assignment at the CEO's Office at National Petroleum. Good morning. Ria Krasasam Ryan, Chief Internal Auditor, National Petroleum Marketing Company Limited. Good morning. I'm Nicole King, General Manager, Human Resource and HSSE at National Petroleum Marketing Company Limited. Good morning. I'm Kathleen Nalman, General Manager of Finance, Supply Chain and ICT Acting at the Trinidad and Tobago National Petroleum. Thank you. Thank you very much once again. And again, let me warmly welcome each and every one of you. May I take this opportunity to introduce the members of our committee. I am the chairman, Mr. Weed Mark. And I'll ask my other colleagues to now introduce themselves. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Fitzgerald Hines, member. Thank you, Chairman. Dr. Nian Gazadoli, member. Good morning, Foster Cummings, member. Good morning, Amrita Dionarain, member. I beg your pardon. At this time, I would like to invite the chairman of the National Petroleum Company to make a brief opening statement. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Pleasant good morning to the chairman and committee members and all present here today. Good morning also to the listening and viewing public. We would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to elaborate on NP's operation and performance. NP was formed with a significant mandate that speaks to the marketing, sales, and distribution of petroleum products throughout our Twin Island Republic, ensuring a safe and reliable supply to all citizens. The company plays a key role in the national economic, social, and environmental landscape has become a household name over the years. While the company has been in existence for over 47 years, it has always been an organization in transition. However, in recent times, our operating environment has undergone radical change. And as a result, the organization has had to make ongoing adjustments to remain relevant and to deliver on its mandate. Indeed, we are now faced with intensive competition, increased costs, movements in the price of fuels, and reducing volumes, along with fixed profit margin for an ex extended period of time. The demands of a state enterprise competing with the private sector also presents unique dynamics to the company. In recognition of the company's prevailing challenges, NP has embarked upon a transformation plan. We are of the view that the company is on the right trajectory 
But not, notwithstanding, we recognize there's still a quite a bit of work to be done. Of more recent vintage, the closure of Petrotrin, as well as the increasing cost of fuel to the public, have critical implications for the company, and we have been fully engaged in addressing the implications of these developments. The company has sought to address all the issues raised by the committee to the best of our ability. NP's team assembled here today is ready and willing to address any issues raised with respect to our submission or any other pertinent issues. We look forward to obtaining your perspective on the issues with a view to further improving our, our performance as a corporate and entity. And in this regard, we anticipate meaningful dialogue. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I ask the Permanent Secretary, Acting Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries to make a brief opening statement. Thank you. Good morning again, Chairman and members of the committee. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for extending us this invitation to attend the tech, to the second meeting of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee convened to examine the National Petroleum Marketing Company Limited. With me here today are three senior directors in the ministry, technical directors. Uh, we are here in our capacity as the line ministry responsible for National Petroleum Marketing Company and to provide support to both them and to this committee in any way we can. Uh, having said that, I would just like to thank you again for being here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Acting Permanent Secretary. May I um, begin by following up on earlier remarks made by the Chairman? We know that NP, as you have rightly said, has been around for decades and is and has become a household name and a reasonably good brand. You also mentioned the need for NP to ensure, and NP has been attempting to ensure, a safe and reliable supply of petroleum products. But you also mentioned, very importantly, the recent closure of Petrotrin. And you went on to say that its closure holds critical implications for NP, particularly in terms of costs and fuel supply. Would you like to elaborate for our committee so that we can fully understand what you have said, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Chairman. In the past, until very recently, we are accustomed to certain methods and uh, certain methods of operations and certain protocols in dealing with Petrotrain. Um, that is, while that has not changed significantly, we are not sure we are not absolutely certain how the landscape is, on, is going to unfold or evolve. Um, we had certain financial arrangements and what have you. We had certain, a certain amount of leeway in terms of the payment arrangements to Petrotrain. At this point in time, we are not sure how those arrangements are, they, whether they're going to continue or how are they going to evolve and what challenges they are going to pose, pose for us if there are going to be changes. So it's, it's mainly, uh, Chairman, of, uh, of a financial nature in terms of how that change is going to impact our, financial, um, our financials. The future. The future is uncertain until you drill down a little deeper in the coming period so that you would be in a better position to 
share with the national community what you perceive and the organization as the implications, the real implications, if there are any, for the, in terms of going forward. Is that what you're saying? So from what we have seen so far, we are fairly certain that the arrangements we would have had in the past are going to continue into the future. Okay. May I deal with a very important matter, and that has to do with your strategic plan We understand that there is a plan for the period, is it 2020 to 2022? And that NP would have had to engage outside support or assistance in developing this plan. Would you want to share with this committee, first of all, whether that plan has been completed, one. If it has been completed, whether the plan has been approved by the line ministry. And three, who were the consultants recruited to develop that plan for NP? Chair, would you allow me to defer to my CEO, Mr. Mitchell, on that question? Of course, of course. Thank you, Chairman, <coughs> and thank you, Chairman. At present, NP is operating under the 2018 to 2020 strategic plan. We started the process to develop a new strategic plan around July of this year. Uh, the consultants we're using is ZSL consultants headed by Gregory Maguire. That plan is, I would say, about 90% completed. We expect it to be completed before the end of this month so that we could present it to the board for their first level of approval. It will subsequently be submitted to the ministry for their final approval. Okay. Would you want to share with us um, what is the value of that particular consultancy? Uh, of the t I think it's 225000 I think we would have submitted that information, Chairman. Would you want to share with this committee also how was the consultant chosen? Oh, we had a selective tender process. I don't have the specifics with respect to how many consultants we would have gone out to, but I believe it was somewhere around five consultants would have been invited to submit bids, and these would have been consultants who are well qualified and well known in the local landscape as far as the development of strategic plans are concerned. And coming out of that, we felt that Mr. Maguire and his team, recognizing their skill set in the oil and gas industry, would have been more suitable. And more importantly, out of the tender submission um, that we would have issued, we received two bids, and his was the law of the two. So on that basis, we would have selected him. Would you be kind enough to provide to the Secretariat the details of that process? Absolutely. I also would like to ask the Chairman at this time, because he did make reference to the competition and the challenges posed by the private sector, and the fact that you have witnessed some declines in your sales at the retail level. Could you share with this committee some of the factors that may have led to this development in terms of a decline in sales? And could you share with us, when you talk about a decline, paint a picture for us as to where you were and where you are in terms of sales of fuel to the national community? Sorry, we have maintained market share for around 73 to 74 percent, sometimes ranging to 75 percent, so that we have not lost market share. Nationally, there has been a loss of volume. There's a big, there's been a decline of volumes nationally. 
pardon? 45%. Uh, 45 percent. 45%. 45 percent, sorry. Decline in the national, in the volumes nationally. Um, so in terms of the competition, I'm happy to say that um, we have maintained, we continue to maintain market share. What would you attribute to this loss of volume of 4 to 5 percent? What is the reason that NP has um, assessed, evaluated, or, or analyzed for this drop in volume? Well, firstly, the national economic landscape. Secondly, the increases in prices. People have become more conservative in how they drive, um, obviously. And then the construction industry has taken a significant hit in terms of activity. And that form a significant part of the volumes. Mm. Now, I, I'm sure you would have been hearing and reading about complaints made by the motoring public. I haven't really tested my own experience thus far. I've been so busy like so many of my colleagues I haven't paid attention to it. But there has been reports that the quality of gasoline, whether it's diesel, super gasoline, or, uh, well, particularly super and diesel, the quality has deteriorated. Now, the question that is being asked is whether we have begun to use imported, imported fuel or whether it is the same fuel we are getting from Petrotrin. First of all, have you received any such complaints at the level of MP? And could you share with this committee your, your, your standards of testing in relation to career to determine whether the octane level has deteriorated, whether there has really been a decline? Because I've met customers, citizens, who have told me that they normally would put $90, $100, it will last them for a week. They are now being called upon at the pump to put $160 for the same $90 or $100 that they used to pay a month ago. So I just wanted to ask NP, through you, whether you have received complaints and whether this is true or false or whether people are just imagining things. Chair, let me assure you, members of the committee and the public, as I've done in the past, that there are stringent protocols um, that are undertaken before the, the fuels go to the public. Um, we, have, we would have heard from people on the outside, not as far as I'm, where I sit, not directly, but through the different media, whether it's Twitter, or Facebook, or WhatsApp, or what have you, that there are concerns on the outside. Um, while I think that some of the concerns might be real, I'm of the view a lot of it is just fear mongering outside in the public. Before we take fuel from in fact, fuel that comes from Petrotrain comes with a certificate attesting to certain things, quality and, and what have you. And it comes up to our port at Sea Lot. Before we take custody of that fuel, we take samples and we test it. And we have a first class lab that is constantly certified by Kariwi, the processes and equipment. It's tested to ensure that it meets the specification and then it is offloaded into our tanks and what have you. And every day, uh, we test our fuel before we send it out, send it out. Um, so that the concern about the quality of fuel is really ill-founded. Um, I can't really explain to you, Chair, why somebody be buying $90 and then suddenly paying and run $60, other than the price increase. 
and I'm not sure that the price increase warrants that. But I want to assure the committee, through you, Chair, and the motoring public, that there are very, very stringent measures that are undertaken before the fuel is taken out to the service station to be sold. All right. Well, at this point, then, I'll ask Mrs. Dion, Mrs. Dion Ryan. I know that you have a few questions that you'd like to pursue, so I'll in, now invite you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my question is pertaining to the um, Modi procurement and following the awarding of contracts. So my question is, what mechanisms are currently in place to ensure that proper contract management following the award of contracts, following the award of, con when the award of contracts takes place? Also, um, I would like to know whether there's a monitoring framework that is used to track the progress of contracts regarding the efficient and effective use of resources towards achieving the outputs intended from implementing a contract. So if you allow me, member, to allow my CEO, Mr. Mitchell, to answer, please. Morning again, um, member Dernarain. Uh, first, let's break it down into the different types of contracts that you have, right? And I think the easiest one to deal with would be our capital projects contracts. So let's say we are in the process of constructing a new service station. So we go to tender, right? Given that the cost of that is likely to be above a million dollars, we do a public tender for that. So we receive the bids, we conduct the evaluation, and then we will have a, an approval process based on the recommendation made by the user group. That approval will go to a board tenders committee and then to the board before an award is made. On completion of that award, a contract is signed identifying the scope of work. It would also capture a project implementation timeframe with a project schedule. And you would have progressive payment points based on the speed at which and the progress that has been made in executing that project. The line department at this point in time, which would be the capital projects unit, would be responsible for managing that project. We have in place what we call our projects implementation and monitoring committee. And on a fortnightly basis, we'd have, they'd have to report on the status of each of these projects. Right? The payments would be issued based on the progress made. And then we have coming down to the end of the project, unless we receive the completion certificate, the contract would not be paid off. And that completion certificate allows us to post the move it from work in progress to our fixed asset register for depreciation. If you have a service contract, like a janitorial contract, it requires a different type of arrangement. So let's say on a monthly basis, you would do an evaluation of the work that is being done by the janitors, right? And you would have a fixed base um, cost for that but it would be strictly about monitoring the standard of the work that would be done by the service provider. Again, if you have a contract that speaks to the provision of vehicles, right, you would have standards in there that pertain to the workmanship in terms of the usability of the vehicles, as well as the turnaround time for things like if it goes faulty, how long it gets back in there. Again, we have the administration unit that would monitor those things on an ongoing basis to make sure that whatever service levels are, are, attend to that contract, they are being applied stringently before we effect payments for any work that is done. So those are two of the general categories I can give you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I understand that you all are in the process of establishing a project management office. Yes, we are. Um, can you provide us with an update on the status, please? Right, so we've had quite a bit of internal discussions on that, and the primary reason is that at present we have our engineers doing the project management, uh, in addition to which we don't have enough oversight of all the projects that are being done within the organization. So you would have IT projects, you would have engineering projects, uh, you might have um, maintenance doing a project. And because you have, in some instances, the same resources treating with each of these projects, you don't have clear sight of what the overall demand for projects across the business would be. So the project management unit, or a PMO, 
we look at projects across the organization, try to determine, in a sense, our capacity for in executing projects. Because when you don't have a good feel for the capacity that is required, that's when you get delays and you have um, course overruns and so on. So the PMO would take away that management aspect of projects from the engineers, as it were, but also introduce what we would call modern day project management principles, right? Doing your project charter, making sure you have your quality assurance and quality control, your stakeholder engagement. Those things are not being executed as effectively as we need it to be at this point in time. So at present, we have a structure. We are developing the rules and responsibilities because you have to appreciate that the introduction of a PMO is about culture change. And engineers tend to hold on to that part of where they want to do the work and manage everything. We have to sort of divorce the relationship between those who are doing engineering and those who are doing project management. So the rules, responsibilities to make sure that there's a clear distinction between what engineers do and what project managers do. So that is being developed. The time frame for implementation is first quarter next year. And the reason for that really is we want to tie that with the procurement unit that we're establishing because the PMO would be the reporting entity into the PMO for all the works and reporting and so on that has to be done to the OPR when it's um, fully established. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, just a couple of questions to the chairman, maybe, and if it needs to spread around. Um, the concept of NP under serious competition as one of the issues that you are facing. What are your, who are your main competitors and what areas of your, your business would be under the most competition? Yeah. All right, um, I would, if you would allow Chair, Mr. Mitchell will answer. At present, we have um, committee member Diane Caspioli, doctor, right? We have essentially four lines of business, right? We have the fuel, motor fuel. We have our LPG, liquid, right? We have aviation and marine, and we have lubricants. The area of most intense competition is the lubricants area. You would appreciate that at present we have a multitude of products that come into um, our local market. And as far as we are concerned, they are not subjected to the type of duties and taxes that they need to be. So you have the Valvoline, the Castrol, the Gulf, right? you name it, you have it. Uh, at present, we have a market share of, we, we think, about 28% as far as lubricants is concerned. Year on year, between last year and this year, we've been able to increase our volume sold. So we expect that we'll have an uptick in terms of market share. And to achieve that, we will have gone through a program of advertising, uh, reviewing our core structures, as well as enhancing our marketing. All right, you would have seen a, a lot more newspaper marketing, a lot more electronic marketing, because that is an area of growth for us. All right. Where the motor fuels are concerned, of course, our competitor is Unipet. Right. And then we have aviation and marine. There is no competition in aviation, but in the marine business, you have other providers in the market who could supply fuel to the ships and so on. Uh, interestingly, Petrochin was one of our competitors in that space. Right? So those are the four lines of business, and that's the intensity of competition in each of them. So if I may ask, that 28% market share, that was as of, as of what measurement? What, what year's measurement? Uh, that, that would have been last year. Last year. So right. we expect and, to increase this year. And it's really conceptually derived, because you look at the number of cars mm -hmm. right, in the market, you would say that each car owner would change their fuel, let's say, every three or four times per year. Mm -hmm. And you derive some sort of volume in terms of what the use or purchase of um, lubricants would be in the market. And then we compare what our sales are relative to what mm -hmm. the demand in the market would be. Certainly. Now, with respect to the increased marketing thrust and so on that you um, and back have done, mm -hmm. would that have involved hiring different marketing um, staff? Because, uh, or does, does that involve simply using the marketing staff you have and changing the strategies? We have a 
corporate communications department that is um, the lead entity as far as marketing, but we've now introduced our business intelligence unit within the company as of this year. And one of their remits is the enhancement of marketing across the organization. So they are more focused on developing the marketing strategies in conjunction with our corporate communication department. Our corporate communication department would liaise with the advertising agency, mm -hmm. right? So that's the nexus that has been developed, right? Okay. And your target or market is not just local, is it? Oh, indeed, it's regional, yes. And how are you faring up the islands? Uh, much better. Uh, in terms of our growth, we've seen much more growth externally than locally, actually. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, just for the benefit of the citizens of this country, um, we are looking at the accounts 2009 to 2017, I think it is here. Mm -hmm. In terms of a trajectory, is would you say that NP, Mr. Chairman, is um, improving its profitability, stable, reducing? What would you describe? How would you describe the trajectory through those years? Remember, through the chair, if I may refer to um, can I take that? Committee member, Ms. Um, Senator Hines, Minister Hines. While I would have joined the organization last year, January, what I've recognized is that there are a number of interesting dynamics in terms of the financials of the organization. So you would have seen that for the year ended March 2017, yes. the company would have made a loss. Uh, one of the primary reasons for that is because of the work we did with respect to treating with our work in progress. So we would have a number of projects that would have been either completed or abandoned within the organization that we essentially went through a process of cleaning up. And as a result of that cleanup, our overall depreciation increased by about $17 million. And that led to a loss for the year ended March 2017. Yes, if I'm, if, I think that a loss of some $20.6 million. Ultimately, yes, yes, yes. But if you look at some of the earlier years, you would have seen that the organization went through an issue there with some workers, about 68 workers. Yes. would have been separated and then came back. And that, in and of itself, introduced additional dynamics because with the 68 workers out, right, the performance would have improved. And when they came back in, you had to pay them all this outstanding monies. Was it two years? Or? They worked for two years. So when they came back into the organization, the organization had to redress that entire situation, which would have resulted in a spike in terms of cost, right, especially for employees. And that would have also impacted the, the bottom line, as it will, for the organization. Now, you spoke about or you referred to the financial stability of the organization. And that is an interesting dynamic in that, let's take, for instance, and a good example is the increase in super that would have taken place in October. Where motor fuel is concerned, we operate on a fixed margin. So even though we had a $1 price increase in super, our revenues would have gone up, right? Because of the increase in price, you would have seen a 1% drop in volumes. But you operate on a fixed margin, so your gross profit would have dropped. So you're talking about increasing revenue, but decreasing gross profits, yeah? Your business levy would have gone up, Right, because if you don't make enough profit, you apply business levy as against corporate tax, and your green fund levy would have gone up. Yes. So you put us in a hole, yeah? So recognizing those circumstances, and recognizing the desire for the elimination of subsidies, it means that we have to look at alternative sources of revenue. Those alternative sources of revenue would be in the areas of marine, or we feel we can do some bunkering and provide service to ships and so on. Uh, 
especially the ENI companies that do offshore drilling and so on. I would have made mention of the area of lubricants. We feel that if we do a better job, right, we can re realize a better return as far as lubricants is concerned. And also in the LPG market, where at present we have about 51% market share, we feel we could do a little better in that space. Right, so those are the areas of focus to ensure that we have a long-term sustainability and viability for the organization. Well, my chairman is prompting me in terms of alternative businesses, and we're talking about, we have quite a bit of an asset base where uh, land space is concerned, because following the acquisition of the SOs and BPs and so on, we had a number of service stations that were in close proximity, so we did some consolidation. So we now have a number of vacant properties that we're in the process of leasing out, because that is also a form of revenue. Right. How many service stations do you have all together now since you raised that? It's about 160 to 170, right, with about one, one in, well, two under construction, one in, the one in Shaguanas, which on Trial Street, which we expect to open in the first quarter next year. And you would have seen the one at Il Socorro, which we hope to open shortly. So that would bring us about 118 service stations. I understand among them you have some non-viable ones, some that are not. Well, it's interesting in that if I use the same argument of an increase in the price of fuel, yes. realizing reduced profit, the transition point at this time in terms of profitability of a, of a service station is somewhere between 4.5 and, and, and 4.5 and 5 million liters per annum. Yeah. So if you have a service station that is under that and you don't have the, like a quick shop or a convenience store, yes. it will be challenged in terms of its viability. So based on all that you have just said, and I'm very singularly cognizant of the fact that you are a late comer, a late arriver to this platform, Mr. Mitchell. So I'm bearing that in mind. Based on all that you have said, you would agree that there are tremendous amount of risks that face NP in all facets of its operations on an ongoing dynamic basis. You would agree with that? But they are manageable. Huh? But they are manageable. They are manageable. I like your attitude, yes. and I agree with you. Yes. I could see here that back in, well, from the PwC memorandum of weaknesses on internal accounting controls and procedures for the year ended as far back as 2016, the, 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 the uh, overall picture was not very, very wholesome. And one of the things they recommended was a, a formal risk management outfit. Has that been dealt with so far? Not fully. Uh, it's a work in progress. We have now gotten to the point where we have a draft risk management policy. Yes. And the next step would be to establish that risk management committee. But notwithstanding, we should appreciate that risk is managed on a day-to-day -day basis within the organization. Of course. Yeah. But so, a recommendation was made for a formal risk yeah. management outfit. And that is being progress. Um, if you... Um, delve into the notes that we would have submitted, and one of the answers or, or one of the responses that we would have shared is that we introduced a new approved organizational structure in November of last year. Right? With I've the seen intent, that, yes. Right. So, and those are some of the changes that we're making within the organization. So, just as how I made mention of the PMO, right, Project Management Office, the establishment of the procurement unit. The risk is also an area that is also under development. So, this is commendable. To, we, this that? is commendable. Yes, we have to take it in, um, what do you say, biteable sides or chewable bites? Yes. yes. So, that's what we're doing. But I would have thought that between the, the 31st of March 2016 and December of 2018, you would have been able to consume far more than a bite. Well, we have consumed quite a bit. Just, that just hasn't been one of the bites. When I say you, I don't mean you personally. Yes, yes, I the mean organization. NP. Yes, that's just not one of the bites. But I rest assured that the whole issue of risk is being effectively attended to within the organization. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, Mr. Froster, Cummings. 
Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Mitchell, you spoke earlier on about the different areas of the business that NP would be looking to expand. I'm particularly interested in hearing a bit more about the bunkering uh, and in terms of supply of fuel to the marine industry and how aggressive is NP pursuing this and what is in place now and how do you plan to expand? Uh, Member Cummings, you know, that's, that's one of the challenges of state enterprises competing with the private sector. You give out trade secrets. So yes, I would like to you know, respond to your question, but I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, because we really want to protect some of this information. So I, I want to respond to you, but... I hear you loud yeah, and clear. So from a strategic standpoint... I hear you loud yeah, and clear, yeah. but, but is NP actually involved in the area now? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, like Companies like Shell and so on, uh, we utilize the facilities of Petrotrin, or we do it, um, we do the, use the RTW to deliver fuel on the shore side. But we want to establish more, what should I say? We want to have more established facilities to do it on a larger scale, given um, both the expectation that there will be the more exploration, but also coming out of the issue with the widening of the Panama Canal and more ships being in the region. And we have the facility that is supposed to be established in library. It gives us the avenue to really increase our business in that area. Additionally, in terms of the business of the islands, what is the area of focus there? Which of the lubricants, LPG? I'm trying to get some information. Right. What, what, what is the focus there? Lubricants, also bunkering, right? We see opportunity there. Um, to the extent that we see it being viable, the issue of um, motor fuel, because right now we have a facility in Dominica, right? And uh, depending on the direction of the market, because you need to appreciate also that um, the market is moving to the trend of electric cars, right? hybrid vehicles, right? So it's something you have to monitor closely. In addition to which, the smaller islands have small market sizes. So a viability analysis has to be conducted in terms of the economy, demand for fuel, and so on. And if you were to embark on any such venture, to manage our risk, it'd be more like doing a, a joint venture rather than going alone, right? So those are the things that are under consideration at this point in time. Yeah. Um, Mr. CEO, the matter of competition, which we all respect, um, and you would want to reveal secrets, but I would advise you to, if you can commit absolutely to writing submit yes and submit to the secretary. Absolutely, chairman. we shall use those things yes. in confidence. Yes. Okay, I will, chairman. We understand. So we want it committed in writing. Um, I want to ask. Question, a few questions. We saw an internal audit report which referred to the security monitoring system and particularly involving cameras. And we recognize that this system monitor, that monitoring system, rather, apparently is not manned. We do not have warm bodies manning the security system monitoring mechanism that you have at NP. And what we understand takes place as spot checks, posts, maybe any incident you would need to investigate. Could you share with this committee what was the rationale 
for the non-monitoring of security cameras during the day or night, or even assigning an officer to monitor the activities of this security system? Who would like to provide us with some clarification on this matter? I, I will, Chairman. Um. Yes, Mr. CEO? Yeah, yeah. Mr. Chairman, that report was done in April, I believe, of this year. And uh, to be quite honest, the camera network that we have on location, it was installed about two years ago, I believe. And uh, the arrangement was that TSTT would do, be doing the monitoring, right? So it was part of a service that was being provided through TSTT. However, in recognition of the gaps, right, because the, the overall performance of the infrastructure, which informed the audit that was done, left quite a bit to be desired because on an ongoing basis, you would have had a number of cameras that would be down or out of service for an extended period of time. So we recognize the need to do some enhancements. So certainly since the advent of that audit report, we've now gone through a process of having daily checks and daily reports on all our cameras and their performance. We have a closer relationship with TSCT in terms of response time to repair those that are down. And we are in the process of establishing a video wall in the security department, because that never existed before. And taking away from TSCD that responsibility to do monitoring. We've also hired a warm body, as it were, to do dedicated monitoring of our security cameras. Because you would appreciate that we are located in a hotspot, one. But additionally, what we've done is hired two new resources to lead our security unit, because that was one of the areas that we felt we had some significant um, deficiency. So we've moved past what would have been indicated in that audit report to really enhancing our security levels within the organization. So you feel satisfied at this time that you are I'm, in a... I'm not totally satisfied if the video wall is not up as yet. We, we monitor on a general screen, right? So we could, we have different individual screens that we use, but we need a video wall where we could enhance images and zoom in and all that sort of fancy stuff. So that is being progressed right now. Could you advise us when the system, the security monitoring system was introduced, um, by whom, in terms of the company? TSCT. And at what value? And if you don't have it, could you yeah, supply I, I think it's around 400,000. Yeah, but we could submit it. I believe it's around $400,000 we would have paid. So that, I, that I, system was introduced and there was no mechanism um, in place to properly monitor um, the operations of that system. It was so delegated. So that NP could have gotten maximum value for that investment of 400000 Well, it wasn't paid in a lump sum. It was paid over a period of time. It does not matter. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. But um, yes, delegating the monitoring to TSTT, I would say was an oversight, but that was the nature of the contract that would have been signed. So the contract that was signed did not provide or make any provision for TSTT to have a monitoring role. It was left up to NP to effect that, and no, MP didn't do it. No, no, the, the contract that was signed, the service of monitoring was provided by TSCD. Yeah. So that was an integral part of the contract that was signed with TSCD. Yeah, but then how, how do you explain the internal audit report that talks about you have these system cameras at work, but there was no one monitoring. So what I'm saying, if you're buying or investing to the tune of close to half 100. a million dollars, right. we ought to have at least one warm body because you know, hot spot area. Yes. 
I agree with you fully, Chairman. So what went wrong in that whole arrangement? Something did not, something was not right I agree in that with whole you. arrangement. I agree with you, Chairman. There were oversights, which is why the whole issue of getting better resources to oversee our security, that has been addressed. May I, may I also inquire? I have been advised and I've seen it in your management letter of 2017 that the board of directors does not include a financial expert or a qualified accountant. Is that a fact? And do we still have that same reality or circumstance existing at this time? That Does the board of directors at this time possess or have member have a member who can be described as a financial financial expert or a qualified accountant at this time? That is correct, Chairman, and we have since we have sought to get that matter addressed. I understand it's been currently addressed. Um, now, it was noted that in the, because of the absence of this financial expert or qualified um, accountant, but before I go there, the bylaws of this company, NP, um, would not have allowed for such an appointment. Would you want to clarify for me? In terms of the composition of the board, or may I? I don't know if the investments division of the Ministry of Finance um, could advise us on this one. Is there provision in the bylaws for the appointment of an accountant or somebody with financial expertise to the membership of the board of directors of NP? Is there any such provision in the bylaws? Because we would like to know why, over the years, we didn't have an, um, on that board of directors an, an accountant or a financial expert. Can I have some clarification here? Um. Chairman, uh, in a review of the bylaws, there's no provision at the moment for um, such uh, a qualified accountant at the moment. And is there any intention to address that? Because as you would have known, if you, and I'm sure you are aware, that because of that limitation, we advise via a management letter of 2017 that in the absence of that expert, the National Petroleum Company had to outsource um, a very important activity relevant to that, um, re when in fact in the absence of any experts of a financial nature. They had to um, outsource that particular service, which I am seeing costs the taxpayers over $192,000. So this is a very serious matter. So I would like to know what is being done by the investments division to correct this, what I would like to call lacune or lacune in this particular board of directors arrangement. Um, okay, um, Chairman, the board, uh, in recognizing that there's a deficiency, what they would be required to do is to inform the line ministry of that deficiency, and um, the line may then make recommendations to the secretariat um, for the committee um, on the appointment of boards. 
which is the investments division. Uh, but I, I would like to say that um, the investments division has a, was, has Mr. Well, a member of the Central Audit Committee attend audit committee meetings, you know, to provide some sort of um, advice, as the case may be, when accounting matters come up. Um, Mr. Acton, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries, were you aware? Or was it brought to the attention of the ministry that there was a deficiency in the composition of the board of NP? Not necessarily from the perspective of it not following the law, but from the perspective of NP not having the appropriate financial expertise in its ranks among its members on that board. W were you ever made aware or the ministry ever made aware of this deficiency? Chairman, um, to my knowledge, uh, that information did not come to the ministry other than the report that was sent to permanent secretary within the last month or so with respect to this committee. Well, I'm asking a further question, Acting Permanent Secretary. Were you aware that NP expended some $192,000 to, in a, in a transaction that, has, that was described by NP as very complex and significant. And what is that complex and significant transaction? That has had to do with the imminent transfer of assets of the liquid fuels pipeline project to the liquid fuel company of Trinidad and Tobago. So this is a transaction that occurred and this is where NP did not have the requisite expertise on their board at the material point in time. And we are being told in writing via a management letter that NP had to now go out to acquire that expertise and it costs NP and the taxpayers just around or under 200,000. So I'm asking the question. First of all, you were not aware that there was a deficiency at the level of the board as it relates to the expertise, expertise that were needed. And secondly, not being aware of it, were you also not aware that NP was about to outsource that service, and did that require the line ministry all clear, approval, green light? Were you, can you share with us that, whether you were aware of that? Okay. Chairman, I will ask the <coughs> director of downstream petroleum under whose remit NP operations comes, who may be able to assist. Yes, thank you very much. I, uh, Good morning. Yes. So to that specific question, uh, we were aware of the matter that the assistance would have been provided, um, covered, because we would have had correspondences from NP regarding the, the liquid fuels pipeline project and the issues that would have been um, addressed. The specific transaction, though, would not have been um, brought to our attention around the time of the particular matter that would have been raised by both NP and the con consultant that was used. But, but why? I mean, you say this is a very important transaction. You are the line ministry. You receive correspondences, as you said, from NP on this transaction. Why, why would NP not um, seek your guidance 
and ultimate approval um, on this particular matter, which involves a considerable amount of money. And you are also telling this committee that you were not even aware of the particular consultant that was engaged by NP. So what is your monitoring role as a ministry? What is your real responsibility as it relates to accountability? Because you're talking about taxpayers' money. And NP is not a runaway horse that they can do whatever they wish, whenever they want. They are under the supervision of the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. So can you explain to us this mystery that has developed here, where you were not even involved and aware of the actual material transaction? OK, thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman. And may, may I ask Azama on this? Do you receive minutes uh, um, from NP, board minutes from NP on a regular basis? Because I would imagine this would have had to be minuted in their board meetings which you are entitled to receive quite regularly. So even if they did not inform you, you would have seen it in the minutes that would have been sent to you. Are you in receipt of minutes, by the way, from NP? And how frequently, in accordance with the rules that we have established here? So I'll defer to... Please allow me to clarify. When you, when you asked the question, was I aware? I was not in his capacity at that point in time. With respect to the responses provided to this committee, minutes have been submitted to the ministry on an average monthly basis, and the last board minutes received were from meetings on July 12th, 2018, and September 6th, 2018, to the ministry. With respect to knowledge of the transaction, if those are recorded or documented in those minutes, the incumbent may have been aware of it, but me personally, no. So I just want to clarify that. But to say that the ministry does not know or was not aware, I am not in a position to answer that question. Um, may I ask, are you, are you still aware or not aware of the consultancy that was involved? Do you know the name of the consultants? Are you now aware? The, the sum of $192,000 for this transaction. Are you now aware, as a ministry and the director in charge of downstream operations, can you tell this committee whether you are aware of the name of the consultant that received this sum of money to conduct this transaction in the absence of any financial expert or accountant on the board of directors? Okay, again, I'll ask the director to take this question, please. Yeah. So as pertains to the responses received from the questions of the committee, um, we would have been aware of the, the particular um, additional information surrounding this ma matter. As pertains to the role of the Ministry of Energy, in terms of our uh, role as the Lime Ministry of NP, there will be some certain um, regulatory um, rules and regulatory framework that we will be operating under, and that's separate and apart from the role of the corporation soul. Right, so in so far as the operational aspects of NP will have pertained, the particular matter that was raised um, regarding the liquid fuels pipeline and the liquid fuels company, uh, that will have garnered our attention. Um, and the surrounding background, which is the cost and the consultants use, that would have been um, part and parcel of the, the, the role of the corporation soul uh, in terms of those sort of financial management of the, of the company specific. All right. Well, may I turn to corporation soul, investments division. Could you clarify for our committee whether you were aware of this transaction, whether it was brought to your attention? whether you gave approval for this measure, and also what action you would have taken to ensure that the deficiency outlined in the management letter dealing with the absence of an accountant on the board of directors, what steps would have been taken by the investments division to fill that gap? 
so that NP wouldn't have that challenge in the future. Okay, Chair. Um, the Investments Division receives audited financial statements, and we are not well. We do not require that management letters be submitted to the Investments Division. In the event that um, you know we need further clarification, we may ask that management letters be submitted for scrutiny. And we also receive the board minutes, and as the um, acting permanent secretary said, we have received minutes up to September 20, 2018. However, when we are reviewing the board minutes, what we do, we look, um, we review um, based on strategic decisions that are taken by the board, um, and we forward these um, uh, these reviews, I would say, to the minister, who is corporation soul. And um, I have to say, we look at material transactions, and maybe in review, the amount may not have attracted our attention because it may not have been considered material, you know, and strategic. And therefore, um, it would have not been escalated upwards. I see. Well, then, I will probably ask MP um, at this time, CEO. This transaction and consultancy. Could you tell us what was the process used to award ultimately this contract valued at $192,000 What was the process that was used? Uh, Could you chairman, advise us chairman, if you don't who mind. eventually um, was <coughs> who eventually was able to successfully secure that contract in order to execute this transaction? Um, CEO, could, could you advise us? Yeah. Chairman, if you don't mind, I'd like to just provide a little bit of context around yes. the discussion. Yes, thank you. Um, there isn't any real correlation between the absence of someone with financial accounting expertise and the consultancy. Because even if we had someone on the board with that expertise, we'd have still put this out of consultancy. And the reason for that is we have this massive investment called the Liquid Fuel Pipeline Project in excess of a billion dollars that's going to be coming under one of our subsidiaries that was recently created. Now this item, this facility, has been under construction for the last seven odd years. And if it came into our books, if it came onto our books, right, there could be serious implications for the organization's finances in that Having sat there for such a long period of time, there's the possibility you might have to do some impairment. And given the overall cost of this facility, if we depreciate it over whether it's 25 years, 30 years, just the whole issue of the non-cost depreciation is going to overwhelm not just the subsidiary, but the parent company. And the remit from the ministry was that we should own and operate. And we felt, given our fiduciary responsibility, we needed to provide some feedback on what this is likely to do to us. So we needed the expertise to determine what is the best way without adversely impacting the overall finances of the organization. And in that context, we decided we needed professional expertise. We decided to use our auditors because they have advisory services, one, and they best understand the operations of the organization and the likely impact. Right? So we went through a process where they submitted a bid, we negotiated the price, and we came down to this figure. 
and we felt in the whole scheme of things, this is a reasonable sum, given the importance and the magnitude of the work that had to be done at that point in time. And we ended up at this point. And I need to advise that on completion of this exercise, we advise both our line ministry and the Ministry of Finance in terms of the recommendations of the consultants. Right? So this is no secret. All right, thank you, Mr. Hans. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. Do I understand you to be saying on the point raised that the presence of a person with such expertise on the board right. is, as exists with other board members, simply for the purpose of oversight of the company. Precisely, yes. And that the work I, of the consultant that you have just described had to do with actual engagement of work within the company that was necessary. Precisely, and also given the complexity of the work that was involved. And on that basis, there is no issue between the absence of the board member, the necessary work of the consultant that was executed. None at all as far Am as Am I we are correct concerned. in yeah, None at all as that? far as we are concerned. I would like with your leave, Mr. Chairman, to revert to the question of security because we live in a world where, of course, issues of terrorism and organized crime is rampant and persists as a risk. NP's security outfit consists largely of your own internal security service under the estate constable arrangement. Am I correct? Well, we are supplemented by external. Supplemental police act? Yeah. No, no. Our internal resources, which number about 27, is supplemented by a private. Entity. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm saying it largely consists of your internal security unit, right. NP security personnel, yes. under the Supplemental Police Act, yes. and as well, private security, in this case, amalgamated. Indeed. And they carry out certain functions. As I was saying, security is a very, very critical component of your whole operations, because I, I gather from what I'm seeing... You, you, your, your sea lot spread is about 20 acres of land, am I correct? NP yes. sea lot compound yes. alone is about yes. 20 acres mm -hmm. with multiple access points from both land and sea. And Indeed. I saw, just a passer here, you have some low walls some, uh, at some points around here. But that compound houses your admin offices, your very security <laughs> center, your main fuels tank farm, your, your duty-paid warehouse, your lube oil blending plant, your lube oil tank farm, drum storage area, your chemical stores, your LPG sphere, and some very important, your LPG filling plant. So security to me is a very, very, very critical component. You would agree with that, Mr. CEO? Indeed. Who among you is specifically responsible for the security platform in NP? Today. Our GMHR HSSC. Is that person with us here today? Yes, she is. Could she identify herself so that I can direct my questions to her? Sure, morning. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, altogether, your internal audit, having looked at your security platform, was not very sanguine about the outcomes. Altogether, it is safe to say that your internal audit, they reported in 2017, report dates actually 2018, found that um, overall, this thing is largely unsatisfactory. You agree with that, Madam HR? Yes. Member Hines. And without getting time. into more specifics, you two would have read what I have in front of me here. It commented on your security master plan, validation of firearms and ammunition inventory, the fencing around the compound. It included that which the chairman traversed a while ago, your close, closed circuit TV, your investigations capacity, your security patrols, their working hours. And on that point, I see in one of the reports you issued to us, you made mention of a suboptimal safety culture. 
And um, I kind of go on with the list, moderate light, lighting, which they describe as moderate, all together across the platform, your internal audit found, your security outcomes revealed, the label of unsatisfactory. I just want to say, without belaboring the issues, that is not nearly good enough in today's climate, and for obvious reasons. I would like you to tell us, as best as you can, what immediate actions are being taken to move from unsatisfactory to high. Please. Sure. When the audit was completed in, 20, in April of 18, the audit report did reveal significant gaps. Upon joining the company in January of this year, one of the major activities undertaken by my office, through my office, was to address these audit issues coming out of the audit performed by the Internal Audit Department. About 60% of the audit actions as that you just alluded to, Member Hines, I can report have been successfully closed. We have had increase in terms of our resourcing. We have gotten compliance in terms of our ISPS compliance, which is integral to how we operate. And we are currently engaging strategies that will address the gap of about 40%, which includes a review of the current security master plan for submission for finalization to the board for approval, as well as a review of our standard operating procedures, which is currently being undertaken. So our hope is that within a month to three months that all of the issues raised on the internal audit report would have been addressed and successfully addressed. Well, we pray that that is so. Uh, let me say very quickly, one of the things we have identified, and I saw sub, your words, eh, sub-optimal safety culture, and I know that is not confined only to safety. One of the things that this committee finds as we examine state enterprises is that there is a culture, a culture. It is not my own, it's the government own, it's them own, and that, that permeates a lot of that which is done and that which is not done, mm -hmm. and how it is done and how it ought to be done and ought yes. not to be done. I'm sure we will all, as citizens of this republic, agree with that. Um, one of the things we have discovered consistently here is that we don't always find personnel involved in these, within, throughout the organizations, exerting best practice efforts to get the enterprise from low to high. And in this area, Based on the report of the internal audit, it is very, very clear a lot is going wrong. So I'm happy to know that you're making progress. But for us as a committee, speaking on behalf of the citizens who we rep well, the parliament and the yeah. citizens who we represent, it's not a very healthy picture. And we really would like to see significant improvement because it, you've had some issues. Um, we've had some issues where gas being delivered, and things happen. And a compound like that really needs serious security in today's world. Agreed. And it must be given the highest priority. priority. Agreed. Yes, Mr. CEO. Just to quickly add, uh, Member Hines, that part of the improvement that we are making is to be part of the national security um, architecture as far as manning our compound, as well as all other energy-related facilities in the country. So we are part of that, and we are getting the assistance. So in the event there are issues, we could always rely on them to readily respond to any challenges we have. Yeah. Well, quite apart from that, I'm yeah. talking about you as an yes, entity. Yes, our own in-house. I'm saying apart from our in-house yes. work, we yes. also have external support. That's I mean, right. I didn't get into the details. No yeah. need to, yeah. but, but yeah. really there's a lot to attend to in here. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, member. Yes, Thank you, Chair. I see listed in your responses as one of your weaknesses, the industrial relations climate. And I see mention being made of three impending salary negotiations. I'd like a little more information about what is happening there 
and how it has reached at this point. Reached at this point. What is the situation with your industrial relations climate? This is in your responses, right? Yes, yes. Um, member. At present, the compensation being paid to workers goes back to 2011. For the period 2011 to 2014, that is now before the industrial court. And until that is completed, of course, we won't be able to move on to the subsequent years. The question you ask is a hard one. <laughs> you know, why are we at 2011? And uh, to be quite honest, we don't have a ready answer to that because through a process, it would have ended up at the industrial court. We say that the industrial relations climate needs to be improved, and that is one of the critical factors in improving that climate. And I could quickly add that certainly our workers have been very tolerant, right? Um, they recognize what is happening in the environment, but it doesn't assist them in terms of getting what they feel that they rightly deserve. We had an expectation that the, the court matter, the industrial court matter, would have been completed in November. It has now gone on to March of next year. Right? So it's a situation that the management essentially has to manage. But to the extent that you could have an intervention to expedite that process, we'll be ready, able, and willing to accept that. But that's the challenge as it were at this point in time. If I may, just one other question on that issue. The negotiations of the 2011 to 2014 period that it reached to the, to the point of the industrial court. Um, I, mean, I know that I see that you are of recent vintage, and I, I saw at least a couple of your um, executive staff at re of recent vintage. But the question is, why is it that it had to reach to that point? Is it that nothing um, could have been done to avoid that? Because you are at this point in 2018, workers on 2011 salary. We see the case going on to next year as well. As tolerant as your workers um, have been, and we are very grateful that they have been so. Um, at this stage, what is being done to ensure, once that decision is taken, what is being done to ensure they don't end up in another type of situation? What would have been the root cause of the dissonance that would have reached at that level of the industrial court? And how well, is that being addressed going forward? Remember, you have to appreciate that as a state enterprise, we take guidance from the HR Committee of Cabinet. So based on the dialogue that takes place uh, at that forum, we are guided, right? So we basically would be advised in terms of the way forward on completion of whatever dialogue we'd have with that committee, right? So at this point in time, the position is that it would remain in the court because it's nearing completion, right? We expect it to be certainly completed by March of next year. And then for the subsequent years, we have to get guidance in terms of the direction we need to take. Um, I don't know if I, anybody else could add anything, but that's as much as I know at this point. No, no. Um, Nicole, anything else you want to add? No, I think that you covered it, CEO. Um, as CEO Mitchell said, um, member Gatsby Dolly, we are guided by the HR committee and uh, those are the instructions we have at this time. We certainly understand and appreciate the um, current environment in terms of the, the workers' you know, current situation, and it is our hope that next year that this matter is finalized, and then we would certainly seek further direction so that we can expedite the, the years following 2014. When did the matter begin? How long has this matter been in the industrial court? The matter has been in the industrial court for quite some time. Um, the hearings actually only started in June in, in earnest, and uh, the matter is currently going on. In fact, it's um, at court today, and it continues again uh, one more day this month and then into 2019. So when, so when did the negotiations begin for that period then? I am not, I'm, I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure. In terms of me coming in, it's at the stage of where it's at the, in, in the industrial court. Is anybody, can anybody shed some light on when the negotiations actually began? That's 2011, 2014. When did the negotiations begin? 2011 to 2014. I don't want to be um, held to ransom for my response. Yeah. But I would have believed it would have been started either 2010 or 2011. That would have, it would have commenced. No, 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 no. It's quite some time. Yeah. 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 It's in the court. Yeah. But certainly we can provide a response, a more formal response. Yes, yeah. please. I think yeah. the community would appreciate that. Yes. Thank you. Um, may I follow up on an earlier question raised by my colleague, Mr. Hines, by asking Mrs. CEO, when we look through the 2009 to 2017 audited financial statements, we saw some broad numbers under administration and under operating expenses. But we, there was not a specific item that could have guided our committee as it relates to your total security expenses for any one financial year. Would you like to share with this committee what was your total security expenses for fiscal 2017? Uh, Chair, because it is not, it is not the details of it is not there, is what you're saying, Chairman. I didn't hear you. The details of it is not there. No, we, we are not seeing no item mark security, security expenses. All right. Allow me to defer to my finance people, if you don't mind, Chairman. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I like you. Good morning, Chairman. Yes. Uh, with respect to the security expenses, as you stated, we currently have amalgamated security for the period 2018. We do have some payments for the period 2013 to 2018, so I need to be guided on specifically what... Could you put it in writing for us? Sure. And give us a detail. The company that was there between that period, we are the only period, eh? Yes. 2009? Mm-hmm. 20 to the current time. Give us the following. The name of the security company or companies and the annual payments. And then another category would be other related security expenses and give us a detailed breakdown of those. Great. Yes, Chair. Noted. Yeah, you could put that in writing for us. Um, I would like to turn to what that is um, is an item I would like to get some clarification on. But before I deal with that item, may I just clarify, seek clarification? First of all, I would like to know, and whoever wishes, Mr. Chairman, um, to deal with it, you can guide me on that. What percentage of works and services and articles are conducted by public tendering? Chair, if you'll permit, we'll provide the, that information in writing to the, to okay. the, and the committee. Yes. The other one I would like to get clarified, and this is to the CEO, under what special circumstances can the CEO seek exemption from public tendering from the board of 
or from the Board Tenders Committee for contracts in excess of $750,000. Chairman, I'll just defer to the Corporate Secretary who has the details on that. Okay, thank you. Good morning again, Chairman. Thank you, morning. The Article 4 of the Tenders Procedure Guide simply says, where special circumstances warrant, the CEO may seek exemption from public tendering. So where the circumstances arise, whether it's because um, you, know, you have a limited number of providers for the proposed works and services, the CEO would forward a recommendation which is based on a justification which is received from the line department to the BTC for consideration by the BTC um, for approval for an exemption from public tendering. So there are not any specific circumstances listed in the guide. It is treated on a case-by-case -case basis with a justification from the line department that's seeking the exemption. But, but is that satisfactory, uh, Mr. Chairman? Um, that is, that is to this, that gives the CEO the too much, there's too much discretion there. We, we, we leave special circumstances open. Have you thought about trying to get some clarification or direction or has the board turned to the Ministry of Finance um, Investments Division for guidance on this matter? Because so, special circumstances ought to be defined so that the CEO and the board would be, direct, would be guided. But if it is left as broad and open as what we have been told, that, uh, that may cause some challenges for the board and for your own safety, I would say, and, and security so that and welfare. The so that the CEO operates under certain guidelines and certain yes. limits in terms of the, the autonomy he has to um, engage in financial transactions. Yeah. All matters that go out, even those that fall under the authority of managers, are brought to the BTC for scrutiny and further on to the board for scrutiny. With explanations, I can assure you that ro robust questions are asked about these processes and reasons for wanting to, so that um, that, has worked, that has worked well and currently works for us. And yes, I, I get the point you are making in terms of um, you know, having clear and absolute <coughs> guidelines. Yeah. yeah, and what I'm suggesting is that we know we have the procurement law is supposed to be fully proclaimed, regulations are supposed to be um, developed by the procurement regulator. But in the absence of the law being proclaimed and in the absence of regulations being promulgated, I'm just, I just believe that the investments division, the Ministry of Energy, along with NP, should try to outline boundaries and under what circumstances, special circumstances, special circumstances, what that means. There must be guidelines for that, from my perspective. But I will ask uh, Mrs. Dionorine to intervene at this time. Um, so I just want to take the whole issue um, with respect to the written responses for the weaknesses identified. Um, I understand that one of the weaknesses that um, was identified was that there's an underutilization of IT across businesses, or across business. Um, so what exactly are the problems restricting the full utilization of IT? And is it that the full automation of the procurement process is, is subsumed under this? And also, is the whole security system subsumed under this? Um, what are these problems? Um, is it uh, that you will have like a development, uh, IT strategy under development? Uh, member Donor? Yeah. Let's treat with IT as an entity in and of itself. 
right? So at present, we have uh, ERP, right? It's called SGC. And we have a number of modules, right? So you have your finance, your inventory, you name it. And if we were to say generally, maximum utilization of that would have been a 10. Right now, we are at about 4. Right? So two things come about, change management and leadership. Yeah? But subsumed in that is the preparation of the people to exploit the infrastructure. So what we've done within the organization, try to make sure that people have the skills to utilize the infrastructure, one. And secondly, make sure they are properly trained. Right? So we've had new training on the infrastructure, making sure that people develop their information technology skills. The next part is the change management, making sure that people actually use the systems and move away from the manual processes that are now being used within the organization. Right? So suffice it to say that the level of attention and drive to enhance the level of IT utilization in the organization that is being enhanced at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have a timeline in which you are working with? Well, that is ongoing now. Okay. A lot of the training has been completed. Um, we started IT training across the organization, right, from the lowest person to the highest person in the organization, making people at a, a particular level. And we're in the process of putting a, a, a rigorous change management facility in place to make sure that there's greater use of the infrastructure that we've already invested in. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the automation of the procurement process. Um, can you give us some details on this um, project or, and also um, a status, give us a status on when you, when you intend- When you say procurement, Automation of the procurement? I'm not so sure I follow. Okay, so in, the, in one of your return responses, mm -hmm. um, you spoke about the full automation of the entire procurement process, mm -hmm. right? So my question is, what is the status of the full automation of that entire procurement process? At, at present, part of the challenge is that Procurement is fragmented across the organization. And I think that in and of itself undermines the use or the ability to use technology to address it. So for instance, we have one area of the organization that purchases our base oils and additives that we use to make lubricants, right? So they would use a system that doesn't involve the use of the ARP in terms of their procurement, right? So. We have what you call an MRP, Material Resource Planning Facility. And there is a need for them to utilize that in terms of the procurement process, right? So that's part of the training that has been completed. If you talk about purchasing spares and so on, there is some degree of use of the system to purchase spares because we have a number of service stations. We have equipment there, they have to purchase spares. But more than anything else, the focus now has to be on bringing the overall procurement function under one body, right? So instead of having it as fragmented as it is now, it's to have it under one head and in the process streamline the use of information technology to address the whole procurement process. Right, so, so we would have indicated where we are in terms of rolling out that procurement unit in concert with the requirements of the procurement regulations act. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We spoke earlier, um, who is responsible for your accounts among us here today? Yes, we spoke earlier about the absence of someone with accounting expertise on the board and we dealt with that issue. Um, we might need someone with accounting expertise on this side of the table here today. I've been looking through your 2017 accounts in search for an answer to the chairman's question about the cost of security and some other costs that you might be concerned about. Um, and quite frankly, even making use of your notes, 
the notes to your accounts. I can't find it. Would you be kind enough, therefore, to direct me to the head or the place in these wonderful accounts? I have in my hand the consolidated financial statements as at March the 31st, 2017. And I would like you to direct me to where I, as a reader, member of this committee, would find an answer to the chairman's question as to the uh, cost of security and um, maybe even legal costs. These are things we, we, we would like to see. Yes. Page six of the consolidated financial statements for 2017. Yes. And there you would see broad categories of our distribution costs. Yes, I've seen our that. Our admin costs and other expenses. Yes. In terms of security, those would be all part of that other expenses figure. Yes. But the notes to the account, note 23, does, would not provide you with the detailed breakdown in terms of Where my, would I find those details? Note 23. No, no, can, where would I find those details? In note 23? You will get the, uh, some level, but in terms of item, as you've asked for professional fees or security, the note will not encompass all the expenses as shown in the financial statement. So am I correct in thinking that, th that this document in front of me would not answer the questions? That it may not. It did not me. It does not. <laughs> okay, sir. Take You'll it. agree? I agree, sir. Would you be kind enough, therefore, to assist us by putting that in writing and advance that to us, Mr. CEO, at the earliest opportunity? I thank you for the periods under review in this exercise. I, that is to say, 2009 through to 2017. So we can get a sense of where we are. Because we have seen entities come here, and we saw where their administrative expenses, their living expenses, so to speak, with a small l, far outweigh the amount that they're supposed to be targeting at the service that state enterprise is providing. And we saw that already. Y you understand? We've seen strange things here. Trinidad is a wonderfully strange land. So we would like to get a little bit of insight in those things, okay? Sure. Noted. I thank you. And we look forward to that. Thank you very much, Mr. Hines. Um, Mr. CEO, I would like to, to ask you to join me in looking at the internal audit department report observation of the year and 31st of March, 2018, inventory count. You, you, you would, if you can follow me on that, that's, that's a submission that you have made. And, and it deals with, um, I'm on page two of that report. And we are looking at main fuels at Piaco, which started on page one. First of all, if you could just explain to this committee the details of this table, and then we go on to the... I'm on page... Are you with me on the actual um, internal, or the internal audit department report? I'm on page one of that report. It deals with observation. The heading is observations and conclusions on page one. You have that? Yes. Yeah, we, we, we try to, I am trying on behalf of the committee to get some clarification on your physical inventory. And I'm looking at an item entitled main fuels, and that is at Piaco, and main fuels at sea lots. And I'm seeing some disturbing materials before me. For example, before you clarify what I've like, 
I would like you to clarify. I'm seen under main fuels at your sealots compound. It reads, the perpetual records of the fuel inventory at sealots were not available. Now, I'm taking perpetual records to mean the total volume or the total amount of liters of fuel that you had stored, right? Mm -hmm. At the particular point in time, whether it is Super 92, auto diesel, and the rest of fuels. But we are being told by the internal auditor that the perpetual records of the fuel inventory at sealots were not available and therefore only a count of the physical quantity was done and therefore variances could not be determined. Well, this is what I'm trying to get the CEO to explain. What does perpetual records mean in this context and the fact that they were not available because that would have been impacted on NP's profitability, its sales. Because if you cannot account for what you have, and the variances cannot be determined because of the absence of records, that bound to impact, it is bound to impact on your bottom line, on your sales figures on your profitability. So something is, some, we need clarification on this matter as it relates to the internal or the department's observation. What is happening to your records? Just, so first of all, could you clarify for this committee what is meant by perpetual records? the physical quantity, and you see what is there on page two, main fuels at Piaco, explain this table for us. And then, then, then explain to us what is taking place on the main fuels at sea lots. Okay. So I, we need two, two sets of explanations, okay. Piaco okay. and sea lots, and you, give us definitions of the concepts. Okay. Chairman, I'll just defer to the person who has the expertise in that area, Ms. John Benjamin, to provide the expertise. Oh. Who's your internal auditor here? Ms. I am. Ria. Mm -hmm. Madam Auditor, could, would you be kind enough to explain to the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee your your, your information as recorded, starting on page one, main fuels, Piaco, and it goes on page two, um, main fuel sealots. And could you tell us what are the implications for NP operations as it relates to your profitability and your sales in the absence and deficiencies that you have outlined in this report. Clarify this for us. Certainly, Chairman. Um, just to be clear, the perpetual records for any inventory count would normally be available at the point of the count. So our observation indicated that at the point of counting, the perpetual records were not available. Not that they were not available entirely, but at the point of the count, it was not available. So it made it difficult at the scene to reconcile or to identify what variances exist, right? Because normally, it, when you do an inventory count, the perpetual records tell you this is what our system has as the balance. And when you do the physical count, you would verify by, well, in this case, main fuels by dips or whatever gauge readings, this, these are what the readings tell us. So when we attended this count, the, we were able to physically verify the records 
but normally we would have the perpetual record with us to say, for example, well, we found 1 million, 1.5, we confirm 1.5 million liters. However, the perpetual records would say it was really on the system as 1.6. So the actual record need to be adjusted downwards to this because of whatever reason the reconciliation is closed. So in terms of the financial statements, that reconciliation was done after the fact, right? Not at the point, the identification of the variance could not be done at the point of the count. Right? So I wouldn't say that there are implications for the financial statements unless those records were not reconciled and they were subsequently. Yes, but uh, just to follow up. Please, in the very document at the end, mm -hmm. under the rubric of recommendations, and mm -hmm. we are speaking in a language that the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago would understand. So bear with us if we appear pedantic. The inability to identify and resolve variances during the stock count process, especially the material items such as fuel and raw materials, mm -hmm. has the potential to conceal product losses and thereby misstate the financial statements, as the mm -hmm. chairman alluded to. Mm -hmm. The perpetual records for all products to be counted must be made available by the finance department to the count team prior to the start of the exercise. Mm -hmm. And it recommends that steps must be taken to determine why personnel who were aware of the count were absent when the execution of their duties was required. Company personnel should be held accountable when they abdicate their responsibilities. And so the story goes. So that... Um, there is some risks in here, and I would like to know a little better, for the benefit of those who are listening and viewing us, what do we mean by perpetual records? Is that the capacity? No, the perpetual records is what uh, we use a system called SDC, and SDC is, the, is where... SDC the, or STC? No, <laughs> SDC, System Dynamics. Corporation, yes. and that, that software is where we record the actual volumes for different fuels and whatnot. Yes. And in the perpetual records, it is called perpetual because it's supposed to be updated as there are movements, right? So that, that's the reason for it being perpetual. Okay. Right? And yes. what we are saying is when we have those, that information available on site while we are doing a count, it makes reconciliation easier, it facilitates easier reconciliation when we know what the records say versus what the actual physical count says. So for example, where there may have been a sale in the morning, right, the system would not, may not have been updated for that sale, but when we count the system, the actual physical quantities, we could see, well, okay, it is less because of that sale that was done in the morning that we did and thereafter we counted. So the perpetual records will give you an ongoing running balance of what your fuels are, the volumes, that is. I hope that clarifies. What my colleague has asked, and by asking the internal auditor the following question. Does NP maintain a perpetual record of the fuel inventory at sea lots? Yes. All locations have uh, an attached record of the perpetual inventory, all locations. And the issue for this observation, which we attended at the year end, was that when we attended the location, the, per, the records were not provided to the count team who were assisting us with the inventory observation. And those records should be available for, to the count team to enable them to identify why there may be differences to what is physically counted. So yeah, they, but, um, but, 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 but could you explain to us the reason for these records, the perpetual records of the fuel inventory not being made available for the for internal audit examination by the finance department because you were on the spot you you went to do your job mm -hmm. the people who were supposed to be present were not present at the time to provide you with the records 
And I'm asking, based on, we, we need clarification as to the reason why those records were not made available at the material point in time. Were these people, they were just not present to provide you with the details of the records because you needed those records to complete your work. So why were those records not made available to you at the material point in time? I think um, there are points in time when sometimes there is, a, there is required conversion of the, what we see physically to what this, how the system records it. Right? So it's not that the people weren't present or um, the information wasn't available by the finance department, right? The thing is, there are times when conversion, I understand that the finance team takes certain readings and they convert it into what the system has. So it may be recorded. We may check inches and whatever are the tanks physically, and then they will take that information and convert it to what the system records in volume, liters or whatever. So I think an absence of the, that being done they did not update the physical, the perpetual records, that is. And in that instance, that may be why we did not get the perpetual records at the time. I'm not sure. I can't speak to why it would not have been available at certain locations, but that may be one of the reasons why. The conversion may not have been completed. I would ask. I could All probably right. get some assistance from right. no, finance. No, no. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. May I ask the CEO to probably guide us on this one? Explain Please. to us. Certainly, Chair. <clears throat> Having looked at this audit report, I did pose some of those questions. And the very point you're making there, steps must be taken to determine why personnel who are aware of the count were absent when execution of their, when execution of their duties was required. And I posed the question to the managers, and I said, the people were on site. But remember, it's a 20-acre compound. And these people who are involved in this exercise, they have different, like you have storage tanks, you have the LPG, and so on. And there's a possibility that at the point in time they went to this specific tank, the person may have been on another exercise or on another area. But at the point in time when the auditor was conducting their work, the person wasn't available. But the people who were supposed to be part, the line people who were supposed to be part of this exercise, yes, they were aware, but they have other things to do because the auditor is moving around the compound doing different measurements, and they can't just stick with the auditor because they have other assignments. So they just weren't available at that point in time. So I did investigate this particular issue. Um, could you advise us whether this was happening before the audit was conducted in 2015 and 2016? Excuse me, Chairman? This situation that we have outlined, right. could you advise us whether it was happening? I, I can't say, Chairman. Um, if I may, there were prior reports written where the this, this same situation would have been reported. So yes, there were instances where it would have happened. At the physical counts, at the year end. And those, and those reports, you will make those available to us? All the reports that are issued from internal audit would, be, would have been sent to the ministry, and we can make them available to you if right. you have not received them. All right, I turn to Thank you very warmly. In fairness uh, to, to, to NP, Mr. Chairman, I have noticed in the same segment that we were reading a while ago from this internal audit, in terms of its observations and conclusions, observations of the physical inventory, I noticed they have been rated high. And it says overall control procedures were adequate with the exception of the perpetual records not, be, records not being made available for all locations. And therefore, you know, I also observe that a recommendation is that all of your short tanks should have gauges installed at the top and yeah. bottom, yeah. and regular maintenance checks be performed to ensure that these gauges are working efficiently at all times. Do they now have those? Since we are at the bottom of 2018, 
And this was issued, oh, April 2018 is the date of this. Um, have we installed those gauges just to ensure that um, they're working correctly? Yeah. Thank yeah. you very warmly. Yes, um, good day, member. Um, <clears throat> the, the tank gauging system in sea lots was an uh, ongoing project that was um, executed um, in around 2013 onwards. Uh, because of the extingencies of the operation, the, these gauges can only um, be installed when the tanks are taken out of service. We have progressed to complete about 85% of those gauges, to which we have three tanks that we do not have electronic gauges, but we have mechanical gauges. And we are in the process now of having uh, two tanks taken out of service to do um, integrity checks and, by extension, install those new gauges. So it has been a, it has been a exercise that has been ongoing. Where there are instances where there are anomalies with the gauges, our maintenance department will take lead to verify those gauges against manual dips to ensure that what the electronic gauge is reading com compares to a physical dip. And that is an ongoing exercise that, that takes place from time to time. Once uh, the reporting department makes a, a report that there is some anomaly, then uh, those checks are done. Yeah, yes, what happened is that we have, we have the base oil tank farm, and then we have the white oil tank farm. So um, together we have about, uh, we have five storage tanks on the western side, and then we have, it, it, it's 11 white oil tanks, and then we have about 13 base oil tanks. With the exception of tank uh, four and tank five, the majority of the other tanks are fitted with gauges. Yes, the reason being is that um, tank five is presently out of service for asset integrity checks and the gauges, the gauge works will be installed and when that is completed, tank four will be taken out of service and um, a similar arrangement will take place. We, we have to manage the fact that because of the limited storage at sea lots, that we have, to, we have to schedule the removal of tanks out of service so that they don't impact our ability to deliver the quantity of fuel to the market. So that is something that we need to coordinate. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I Thank you, Chairman. I think the CEO can answer this question. You spoke about the lost position of NP in 2017. Let us say for 2018 so far, first half of the year, how has the performance been for the first two quarters or so? Uh, Member Cummins, let me answer that in two shots. Uh, so at March 2017, we reported a loss, um, operating minus six, and after we added business levy, it came down to about minus 20 or so, right? Kathleen, just keep me honest here. We've just about completed March 2018, right? We have an operating profit of 10. After we apply business levy, we might get into a minus position. Right, so the operating profit is $10 million. For this fiscal year, as at the end of October, profit before tax was $32 million. But you have to appreciate that when you do your consolidated financial or audited reports, you have to look at things like your pension contribution. You might have a top up. You have to relook your whole issue of depreciation and so on. So as at End of October, like I said, 32 million. Our target for this year was 35. So we might just go beyond that. But after you start applying those sort of extraneous items, right, then you'll get a true picture of what the financial situation is. If your concern is about the long-term viability of the organization, 
yes, that is foremost uh, in our minds. So we have to look at the whole issue of revenue and managing our cost, right? And that is an active issue within the organization. How do we effectively manage our costs, right? Looking at our big ticket cost items, but also looking at opportunities to enhance revenues as we go forward. So that is, as I say, front and center for the organization. Is, is NP in receipt of a subvention from the government? No, we are not. I, do, I can't remember the last time we'd have gotten one. What about the debt position? We are no debt, and we have quite a few investments, actually. Right, what we try to do is um, leverage all the assets of the organization, even our cash flow. So if we have some extra cash, we try to put into, into short-term investments and so on. Yeah, because we need every penny, as it were. Yeah. That program you spoke of earlier about monetizing some of the dormant um, land assets. assets. Yes. Land assets. Yes. How is that progressing? Uh, thus far, we have about about ten properties that we have leased out. Right. The revenues from that at this point in time is about sixty thousand per month. We want to get that to over 100,000 by the end of this fiscal year. Some of these assets, I assume, will be strategic, strategically located because service stations are usually in high pedestrian areas and so forth. Yes. Uh, is, is there a plan to not just lease some of these assets as is, but to possibly look at development of some of these properties um, that will yield a higher return? Uh, if you're speaking about development from the standpoint of uh, capital investment, we have to manage that situation because we're also looking at the possibility of going into other lines of business, which would require capital injection. And uh, while we've been successful in terms of using equity to develop the organization, to do on other types of capital investment, which one may consider non-core, right? you might put us into a situation where we might have to borrow. And that is something we have to have further discussions with other stakeholders before we even embark on such a thing. Any consideration of joint venture arrangements? Absolutely, but more so outside of Trinidad, where we you know, share risk for any investment that we deem to be viable. Well, one, thank you. Which one? Which, which, which one? Right, so, uh, my chairman is reminding me that at present we have, we are the design stage for a new service station in Presal. It's going to be a combo um, CNG plus liquid fuels. So we're doing that as a joint venture with NGC, CNG. Finally, that earlier on, in response to a question, you were speaking about the, is it liquid? Pipeline project? Liquid fuel pipeline project, that's in Caroni. It's a pipeline from Point of Pier to Caroni, and then onwards to Pierre Code, where it carries jet fuel. Is that an original NP project? Or? Uh, no, it was not. Um, it was mandated by Cabinet with NGC as the project managers with the intent to have it operated by Petrotrin. Uh, last year, we were directed to establish a subsidiary to undertake the ownership and operation of that facility. It's still in the commissioning stage. And this deals specifically with jet fuel only or other types? No, of from Point of Pier to Caroni, you would have jet super premium and diesel. And from Caroni to Piaco, you have jet only. Yeah. I just have two final questions before we bring our proceedings to a close. The first one, I'd like to clarify with you deals with the CARICOM market. Seeing that Petrotrin is dead, closed down, and your main source of fuel supply, lubricants, used to come from Petrotrin, and you're now going to be importing lubricants to sell or resell to the CARICOM market. Could you share with this committee the viability of your existence, your continued existence in holding on to those market or the market share, given the fact that you are now importing um, lubricants 
that you will now be reselling to CARICOM, to the CARICOM market. Uh, how practical and feasible is that for NP? And do you see any danger in the future for NP? Okay, so Chairman, just a, a bit of clarity. So historically, we'd have purchased we would have purchased from Petrotrin, Jet Fuel, Premium, Super, Regular, Diesel, right? With respect to lubricants, we've always imported our base oils and additives, and we manufacture them at sea lots. That will still continue to be the case. So going forward, the new entity that is replacing Petrotrin, we'll be purchasing the same things, Jet premium super diesel, but our base oils and that we use to manufacture lubricants, that is a whole business model by itself. And that has to be viable. We must make a profit if we are of the view that we want to continue to export into the CARICOM market. Okay. So it's two separate entities. All right, thank you very much for that clarification. And the final question deals with site visits. Now, that is a risk you have described in your submission. Given the risk um, associated when site visits are not conducted by contractors, what steps were taken by the executing division to ensure that all site visits were conducted and the site visit register was properly maintained to reduce the impact of cost overruns and variations. You want to provide us with some clarification on the absence of site visits, the risks that they pose, and how they impact on cost overruns and variations. Chairman, you, you have me. Site visits by contractors. Is it during the execution of works? No, the, during the execution of works that you would have contracted them. Well, Chairman, you know, one of the things that we've introduced, sort of recent vintage, is penalty clauses in all our contracts. So if you have a cost or a delay, a time delay, you're penalized by charging you a certain amount of money per day. So you have a vested interest in trying to complete the works on time. So if you have a situation where a contractor, for whatever reason, doesn't make a site visit or doesn't um, conduct work as required at a particular station, he runs the risk of delaying, delaying the completion of the works. Right? So that is the most effective way of managing your contractors, making sure you have some delay penalty for the completion of the works. And as long as the company is not liable or is a party to the reason why the works are delayed, then certainly that should be effective in getting them to, to make their site visits. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Chairman, if I may, yeah. my colleague just wants to add yeah. to um, In the context of um, site visits, and I think it's in relation to <clears throat> when tenders are issued and there's a site visit that is required by the contractors to inform them of the complexity or the issues that re as it relates to the works that has to be executed. Um, there are two risks involved there. One is that because we are in the situation of crime, we always inform through our retail uh, division to inform the dealer of this intended site visit so that when contractors appear on site, they are aware that this activity is going to take place. Um, so that is, that is one of the ways in which we ma manage because we have had reports that some dealers were concerned of contractors appearing and they, they are not aware of what is taking place. So we have put a system in place to manage that. The other aspect of risk is that if a contractor doesn't attend a site visit and then a bid comes in and in the site visit record it is deemed that that contractor did not uh, attend the site visit and his price may not be in line with what the expected cost of the project would be, especially if it is on the lower end. 
we have a procedure in which we write the contractor to confirm that he understood or understands the complexity of the work and to confirm his bid price and the methodology in which he will use to execute the price. Once we get that confirmation in writing from the contractor, we will proceed with the evaluation. And that is how we treat with those things. The question of quality. How do you ensure quality? Even though you have a penalty clause, as you have outlined, right. how, at the end of the day, do you ensure right. that you get quality mm -hmm. and value for the actual resources that you put out? And I guess this would pertain to capital projects, where we have our project engineers on site on a daily basis. And going forward with the establishment of the project management office, the whole issue of quality assurance and quality control is going to reside within the project office, so they would have oversight of all the projects that are being undertaken. And that is for the future? Yes, by the first quarter of next year. So in the past, how did we... The project engineers themselves would have oversight of the works that are being done by contractors. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman, at this point in time, we'd like to uh, invite you Chairman of NP, to um, bring some brief, if you so desire, closing remarks to be followed by the Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Energy before we conclude our proceedings here to this, morning, this evening. Thank you, Chairman. This afternoon. Thank you, Chairman. As I would have indicated in my opening remarks, NP is a company in transition. And we are trying to deal with all the issues, as you would have discovered in our conversation this morning, that would not have been addressed in the past. We would have had some serious challenges. But I want to say we have a dedicated team and a dedicated group of employees who understand through our conversations and engagement with them what is required and where we need to go. Of course, having said that, we have challenges with culture, but we continue to engage the employees, management, and what have you, in terms of trying to understand how the world has changed around us and what we need to do to continue to be relevant. Permanent Secretary. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for inviting us to this meeting. I have to say that we learned some new, of some new issues today, which our directors will be following up very closely with NP to ensure that they comply with all the statutory requirements, as well as conform to the state enterprises monitoring manual. And having said that, um, we are available to provide any information that you may request or any assistance that the committee may require. Uh, feel free to write us and we will do so. All right, well, may I on behalf of the members of our committee, the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee, um, extend our collective thanks and appreciation to all the officials from the Ministry of Finance Investments Division, the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries, as well as NP officials, along with members of the media and, of course, members of the public. We want to let you know in the event that the committee decides that you need to be called back or return, we shall so communicate with you. In the meantime, the Secretariat will communicate with you in writing areas that we would like further clarification on. You have committed to providing us with a number of um, areas in writing, and we look forward to receiving those submissions in short order. So once again, on behalf of this committee, we'd like to thank you for being here with us, and we look forward to um, further interaction with you, either directly or indirectly, in the not-too-distant future. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>